Hello to everybody. This is Alai De Keffo from Milano, Italy. It's a pleasure for me today to be the co-moderator on uh, this TCT Asia Pacific 2022 session on complex PCI. It's an honor for me to co-moderate this session with Dr. Duke Wu Park. Uh, panelist of the session will be uh, Dr. Du, Dr. Plyerty, Dr. Nakamura, and Dr. Lee. Uh, the session is organized in two uh, different sections. The, the first is uh, on, uh, it's called Conquer the Calcium, and the second, Save the Shock. And so it's a pleasure for me to start the first part of this session, Conquer the Calcium, with the first presentation, when and how to apply the aterectomy devices. And the lecturer is uh, Ajay Kirtane from Columbia University, USA. Hi, thanks so much for having me. Um, I'm going to be happy to present on when and how to apply the use of atherectomy devices for the treatment of severe calcification. Here are my disclosures, largely related to institutional funding to Columbia and the Cardiovascular Research Foundation. We'll start with an illustrative case of a 70-year-old woman who has multiple risk factors and stents that were deployed in the proximal to mid-LAD with noted underexpansion and recurrent symptoms. The patient had to come back. Actually, at that time, after stents were deployed, the patient underwent atherectomy of the stents with stent ablation with balloon uh, angioplasty that was still unable to expand the stents. And then as a result, what ended up happening is um, that patients came back for uh, continued exertional angina. I think you can appreciate here that in the proximal to mid-RCA, sorry, mid-LED, there's um, severe underexpansion of the stent. And unfortunately, despite the use of um, uh, multiple balloons and IVUS wouldn't cross and multiple balloons wouldn't cross. And ultimately, what ended up happening is this patient had to have laser atherectomy with contrast to expand these stents. Um, and the question here after doing this is how could we have prevented this in the first place? Here is the final result, a good result, um, but a lot of work and unfortunately a lot of pain for this patient uh, with a lot of angina that recurred and three separate procedures. So the question is, is this case more broadly generalizable? And I would say yes, because in the modern era with more and more calcified lesions, if you don't prep the lesions adequately, we're gonna be in these types of situations. Here's just another example from uh, Akiko, and um, she's gonna be speaking next, so I won't go into this in too much detail, but classic under expansion within the stent. Unfortunately, for many uh, operators, when they see instant restenosis, their next uh, step is to put in another stent, and this would be a far worse problem if there's severe under expansion due to calcification as seen in this case. Even in studies of DES approval where severe calcification was to be excluded, we saw severe calcification in up to a third of cases within these trials, which means that operators and investigators are not recognizing the extent of calcification when they take patients to the lab. And more recent studies like the Syntax trial where we're talking about surgical type disease, so multivessel disease, you see the prevalence of, of severe calcification in up to half of cases. And we saw a recent publication showing how that was associated with bad outcomes, both with surgery and with stenting. Coronary calcification makes it difficult to do our procedures. I think everybody recognizes that. We all feel that it makes it difficult to deliver stents and also that's an important part of doing the case, but especially there's decreased stent expansion and increased malapposition and stent asymmetry that can occur when there's calcium in the coronary artery. We know that it's associated with increased procedural complications, such as dissections and perforations, but also there are increased rates of stent thrombosis and restenosis. Here is a study that I showed you from syntax out to 10 years, really showing the quite high rate of mortality in lesions that had severe calcification. And this was true in both PCI and cabbage arms. Now, because this, the calcium acts as a concrete cylinder, if you will, you know that stent expansion is not gonna be as great the more the arc of calcium is because there's no place for the stent to expand unless we crack the calcium as I'll show you in certain and slides coming up. And this is just data from the 20 and Dutch peer studies showing you that there's a greater rate of target vessel failure as well as stent thrombosis associated with severe coronary calcification. And in fact, some of these rates of TVS are, are among the highest that we see for any lesion subset that we treat short of, um, for instance, saphenous vein graft disease. Now we have many options. There are balloon-based options. That's not gonna be the focus of this talk. And then there are atherectomy-based options. And that's predominantly what I've been charged to speak about. Irrespective of what we use in order to treat these lesions, calcium fracture is one of the most essential features that you need to have. And the reason is, is if you have a tube 
that's constraining your stent, the only way the stent is going to expand is if that tube is cracked and therefore the stent can expand. And it's been shown that if you have a fracture, it's associated with greater MSA, less restenosis, and less TLR. Now, how can we predict that we'll get a fracture with conventional techniques? There are a couple scoring systems. I know Akiko is going to cover this in detail. This is an OCT-based scoring system looking at angle of calcification, thickness, and length. And more recently, an IVIS-based scoring system that looks similarly at length, circumferentiality of calcium, the nodule presence, and then the vessel size as a whole. And essentially, if you have more bad predictors, you typically are going to need to use a plaque modification strategy such as atherectomy in order to achieve a fracture and then stent expansion as a whole. Now, despite the fact that we have many tools for treatment of coronary calcification, there are actually not very many high-level guideline recommendations for the treatment of coronary calcification. We simply see the only 2A recommendation here is with rotational atherectomy for fibrotic or heavily calcified lesions. And this is because there's not a lot of randomized trial data showing that any of these techniques are superior to balloon angioplasty alone. Now, this will likely change because now we're starting to get more trials within the space, but up to date, this is what we sort of see. Now, as far as how we treat calcified lesions in general, by the angiogram alone, we can determine if things are mild or severe. Now, we can be fooled sometimes, and in more moderate cases, we typically use imaging to arbitrate. And if imaging shows severe calcification, those are the cases we're going to default to an upfront atherectomy or plaque modification strategy. The reason being that we don't want to struggle and struggle and struggle and struggle with balloons before um, failing and then also causing more severe complications. There are more recent algorithms also incorporating lithotripsy. Um, this is a more complicated algorithm, but suffice it to say that the majority of these algorithms suggest that if you see severe calcification, you should think of a strategy that's going to address it and use imaging in many ways to guide what you do. And Akiko will talk about that next. This is just an example of lithotripsy. I'm not going to talk more about that because I was supposed to talk about atherectomy, but this is just an example of how you get calcification fractures with this type of technology. Now, as far as atherectomy itself goes, this is U.S. data, and it's somewhat sobering. It shows that a third of hospitals performing PCI in the U.S. don't perform atherectomy. Increases increase, uh, usage is increasing over time, but this is problematic because without the use of a significant plaque modification strategy, how are these patients being treated? Maybe some of them are being sent to surgery, but maybe others are getting suboptimal PCI, like the case I showed you um, to start this talk. Now, it is increasing in certain populations, like the VA system, where there tends to be a lot of multivessel disease, more smokers. We see a greater instance of atherectomy, and there's actually a decrease in procedural complications associated with atherectomy because it makes the cases likely more simple. Um, this is counterintuitive to many people uh, who believe that atherectomy can be associated with increased complications. I would actually argue the contrary, that we think that if you use it in the right patients, it actually can make the procedure much more uh, easy to proceed. Now, what about the types of atherectomy that are out there? This is the Rota Pro system where the, there's no more foot pedal and everything is actuated in the hand. The 2.0 version actually allows you to have Dynaglide on and off from this button, which makes it a lot easier than the former version that occurred. And the electronic responsiveness, despite um, the fact that you have gas, um, is quite responsive and it works very, very well. In terms of the use of planned versus provisional rotational atherectomy, there are no real studies of this uh, per se, but there's pretty interesting empirical evidence, and this is from the um, uh, registry in Milan, where it showed that if you did planned rota, it was associated with shorter procedure times, less fluoro, less contrast, essentially a less painful procedure than if you started with balloons first and then you had to bail out to rotational atherectomy. And that's one of the reasons why the term rota regret has been, uh, has been coined. You don't want to have thought about it and yet not use an atherectomy-based strategy. Unfortunately, the head-to-head -head trials of rotational atherectomy versus um, balloon alone have not shown that much difference between the two outcomes, except for in the subset of patients with severe calcification. This was from the Rotaxis trial. And similarly, in the PrepareCalc trial, there was a greater degree of strategy success if you went upfront with rotational atherectomy compared with a modified balloon-based strategy. But another way of looking at this study is that 80% of patients could be treated with this modified balloon or an angioscult versus going straight to rotational atherectomy. So I think the jury is still out, and that's one of the reasons why we're conducting trials like the Eclipse trial with orbital atherectomy. When you do rotational atherectomy in general, you do not need super high speeds. You don't need to generate that kind of heat. 
This is a small um, uh, trial looking at the difference between low and high speed and low speed tended to work very well um, as a whole um, in, in this series. Now, moving on beyond rotational atherectomy, a newer kit on the block, if you will, is orbital atherectomy, which um, works in a somewhat different way. You don't have to peck at the lesion like you do with rotational atherectomy. This is more of a smooth traversal. And because um, there's cutting or, or there's no only front cutting, you can actually stop it within the lesion and it's only a one, two, five diameter. So it perhaps allows a little bit more flow, especially with the flush rates that are seen with the system. It's only a single device that orbits around and goes up to 175 if you go on high speed. Um, so this is quite conducive to using in radial cases with six French. The outcomes of this trial uh, were quite good in Orbit 2, which was the approval study. There are late outcomes that are predominantly driven by paraprocedural adverse events as measured by CK. Um, still, you see restenosis events occurring beyond 30 days into a year, commensurate with the fact that this is severely calcified disease. Now, there are ways to reduce procedural complications, and this is data that um, from one of our affiliates down in Florida, which showed that the rate of severe adverse events that were um, generated by using orbital atherectomy were very low if operators were experienced. And I think that's the key point of atherectomy as a whole. You need to have experience to understand when atherectomy makes sense and when it's going to be at high risk. If, for instance, if you're on a severe bend, if there's a lot of tortuosity, a lot of wire bias, that really makes things challenging. With this technology in particular, and also Rotoblader, there are now flexible wires and wires that have much better uh, characteristics for manipulation. And I do feel that these um, uh, wires have made things safer when using it. In terms of use of orbital and rotational atherectomy, they both can be used for many, many cases. I think the relative strengths and the weaknesses of each are shown here. Uh, I think for uh, hardware and setup orbital still has an advantage because you don't have to bring the gas tanks in, but the new system with Rota uh, certainly is better than the older one. I do feel like there's a faster learning curve perhaps um, with, with orbital compared to Rota just because it's a single device. You don't have to change burrs and, and it's very intuitive in that way. But Rota has advantages because it doesn't orbit. You can use it in subintimal lesions. If you use a smaller burr, aorta osteal lesions, perhaps advantage, advantage with severe angulation and bias. One thing I do think that is true though is that, and it may be because of the flush rate of orbital and or the burr size, is there tends to be less, less no reflow associated Associated with it. And so for those cases with tenuous hemodynamics, we tend to favor that um, approach over rotational. But many uses of each. Last Monday, my last day in the lab, I used a case with rota and a case with orbital. Um, so certainly you need, I think, to have all the tools at, at your disposal that you can have. And there are other tools that are non atherectomy tools that are also useful as well, such as shockwave, NC balloons, and specialty balloons that can help as well. The bottom line is either can be used in most cases. As I mentioned before, we are studying 2,000 patients with severely calcified lesions to try to get a higher level indication for atherectomy. And this is orbital atherectomy versus conventional balloon angioplasty. Um, we're, we're more than uh, three quarters enrolled in this trial and hope to be able to present these data in the next one to two years, looking to see if there can be a clinical evidence uh, benefit of, of atherectomy compared to conventional angioplasty alone. So in conclusion, I think we all know that coronary calcification is becoming more and more prevalent in the modern day cath lab and chip era, multiple reasons for it, but we're definitely seeing it in the lab. These are among the highest risk lesions we treat only not only short term, but also for the longer term. And as a result, this field is heating up and imaging is a must. This tees up Akiko's talk, which is so critically important to the treatment of calcium, not only to diagnose it, but to determine what algorithm you're gonna to use to treat it, then not only doing that part, but also before you put the stent in to ensure you have a fracture and then finally to optimize your stents. We do know there's a lot of data out there, more coming soon. So stay tuned for this and uh, hopefully we'll have more evidence generation to help treat our patients better. Thanks so much for listening. So thanks, uh, Jay, uh, Jay, for your presentation. We will discuss uh, further more on these uh, uh, later on at the end of this uh, block. And I think that the conclusion of from Jay are the perfect uh, presentation for the next talk on prepare and predict the role of intracoronary imaging for calcified lesion PCI. And the lecture is uh, Akiko Mahera. So please, uh, Akiko. Thank you. So let's talk how to prepare and predict using the intravascular imaging. Uh, 
Looks like this is a very famous case. And start with this case, and you can see the very severe calcium by angio. And when I look into very carefully, you see the calcium in both sides. And in tangential view, you see the circumferential calcium by angio as well. And this proxima already was treated and patient coming back one year later. And because of the very underexpanded stent due to the severe circumferential calcium behind, that small intima hyperplasia causing the, this type of the issue. And laser delectomy was performed after the making the big calcium fracture behind the stent and finally making the good stent expansion. But as Ajay mentioned, we should avoid this type of the issue at the time of the instant stenosis, and we have to make the perfect job at the time of the index procedure. So let me start with the angio appearance in correlation with the IBAS and OCT. This is the comparison. And in general, if you see the very severe or moderate calcium by angio, we see the large calcium either by IBAS and OCT. That's really true. But also it is important to understand there is a calcium which we couldn't see by angio and we could see only either by IBAS and OCT. And this is a type of the case. And you see the very intermediate region in the distal right coronary artery. And geographically, there is no calcium at all. And we open the IBAS and it looks like this is significant calcium. When we look into this case by OCT, you recognize actually this calcium is quite thin it's not inhibit stent expansion. So it is important to understand what's the total amount of the calcium volume to predict stent expansion. And actually start with angio is quite helpful. If you don't see the calcium by angio, that's indicating the calcium volume is not too many. So if we compare the angio visible versus non-visible calcium in the region which having the IBAS maximum calcium angle is 180, like the case which I show by OCT. And the case which we don't see angio calcium, the thickness of the calcium is more than 0.5, is very little. So meaning like if you don't see the calcium by angio, they are not thick calcium, therefore we have the good stent expansion. So start with the angio is important. And to make more uh, sophisticated way, we create a calcium score by OCT. And each component is important. It's independently correlated with the stent expansion, such as angle and thickness and the length of the calcium. And the reason is because total amount of the calcium altogether that's making the stent expansion. So if you have total amount of the score is four, uh, stent expansion is poor, so we have to do something more. I think as, as Ajay mentioned, what is really the mechanism of the stent expansion in severe calcified region is really making the calcium fracture. And this picture, you see the calcium at the same segment, now that calcium is separate and making the good calcium fracture and stretching by stent. So that's really the mechanism of the stent expansion in severely calcified region. So this is a cohort which we include only the region which was treated by balloon and stent only, except this case, none of the cases having the calcium fracture if the calcium thickness is more than 0.5 millimeter thickness. So whenever you start seeing the thick calcium, you should expect, I cannot make the calcium fracture just balloon and stent, so we have to do more. And recently we published the IBAS calcium score. And because we learn, actually angiographic calcium is important. And because IBAS couldn't tell the thickness of the calcium, so start with the angiographic evaluation is important. And if you don't see the calcium by angio, that's okay. But if you see the calcium, we start calculating the score. The component is following. Similar to the OCT, large calcium such as more than 270 and longer than five millimeter, it's quite important. And circumferential calcium is important. That's very different compared to let's say 330 degree of the calcium. Because if you have some 
non-Kadashim circumference, you can make the good dissection easily. But if you see the circumferential calcium without making the fracture, you never ever get a good stent expansion. The calcified nodule is important. This is really the mark of the chunk of the calcium behind. And finally, actually, this is a very good thing by IBAS. We should see the vessel diameter close as possible of the calcium segment. If you, your vessel is negatively modeling and start with a small vessel, your capacity to make the good stent expansion is less. So you have to have the less threshold to using the atelectomy or something else. So altogether, if the score is more than equal to two, we recommend to do the something else. So let's show this case. And this is a very intermediate region. And you see there's some sort of the calcium somewhere here, but it seems to be very moderate. And we did the IBAS. And the original region was quite soft but we see some uh, intermediate stenosis in here, but, and you see this is circumferential. But when we look into the IVAS carefully, actually this calcium is quite focal. So we are very confident this calcium can be fractured just button only. And then that's what our expectation, and this is how it looks like. We did button and stand and exact same place. You see this calcium is completely separate and stretch. Now you see the big area of the stent expansion and you see the tissue behind stent because there is no longer the calcium on the top. So that's indicating the nice calcium fracture. And actually the importance of the imaging guided scoring is really many times actually you can downgrade of the treatment of the calcium sometimes because as long as you are confident you should be able to making the fracture even but only you are not using the atelectomy. And what is important before stenting is really confirmation of the calcium fracture, because this is really the secure, you can make the good stent expansion. So this case by IBAS, you see the nice calcium fracture here. And after the stenting, that fracture site in stretching wall and making the good stent expansion. This is a case which having the score too, and after the big bar of the rotablator, we can make the good calcium fracture. At the end, we have the good stent expansion. Now you see the tissue behind stent because this calcium was completely separate, indicating the good calcium fracture. We create this score based on the test cohort and we validate in the validation. And you see the score is high, the stent expansion is poor. But if you do the directomy, even the high score, you see the good stent expansion. And also we collect non-angiographic calcium cohort as well. All patient having the maximum calcium by IBAS is more than 270. But none of them having the score is four and even high score, we can get good stent expansion without any adelectomy. So indicating the angiographic non visible calcium is actually indicating thin calcium that doesn't inhibit stent expansion. So altogether, there is a very clear interaction between the calcium score and stent expansion in relation to the atelectomy. So if you have the high score using the atelectomy make much more sense compared to the uh, low number of the calcium score. And the last three, this is we are learning more and more that's calcified nodule. So this is the same case by OCD and IBAS. And the first thing is don't confuse the calcified nodule compared to the red cell thrombus. Many times it is kind of confusing, but if you look into the inside, there is a calcium here. So inside you see the calcium, that's actually calcified nodule. And many times you see the calcium plate behind. And actually the calcified nodule is accumulation of the small nodular calcification. So this is a case 87 years old female, a male and patient having the CKD. And after the atelectomy, the stent was implanted. You see the nice stent expansion, but patient coming back two months later and it seems to be angiographically, looks like this is thrombotic event. And this is IBAS finding after the rotablator at index procedure, looks like nice calcium fracture and stent expansion it looks good. But two months later, this is important. You see the calcified node in the stent. 
this case, we see some fracture. That's probably the reason. But many times we couldn't see the fracture, but we see this type of the nodular calcification in the stent two months later. So the mechanism is really reprotruding the nodule inside of the stent because the nodule itself is actually made by the very small calcium fragments. So this was shown by pathologist. You see the small nodular is in the stent. And those type of the issue occur early and many times recurrent, and the patient suffered MI. And this is a data from Japan showing the with result calcified nodule and their poor outcome. But what is important is they show the late uh, IBAS at the time of the event, and they show about 80% in the region having the calcified nodule is really the mechanism is reproducing the calcium in the stem. So we have to find a good method to make it better. So potential uh, way is could be the risotripsy, even though we don't know well yet in terms of the long-term outcome. You see that looks like the calcified nodule by angio and it looks good after the risotripsy and the stent. This is a different case, but treated by uh, risotripsy. You see the calcified nodule and after the risotripsy, it looks like the calcified nodule is almost reproducing in the region, like here. And after the stenting, you see the good stent expansion. And sometimes we see this type of phenomenon. Finally, uh, this is slightly different topics. And when we are treating the instant stenosis, actually the neoatelial calcium is not really a rare phenomenon. If the patient coming back more than, let's say, three or five years later, the prevalence of neoatelial calcium is quite frequent. And sometimes you see the very sick calcium in the stent or even calcified nodule in the stent. This is due to the neoatelial sclerosis. So understanding what's happening in the stent and confirming the amount of the calcium in the instant stenosis is also important. And then how can we predict the stent expansion in the instant neoatelial calcium is actually quite similar compared to the de novo region. If you have the big calcium or sick calcium, that's really indicating the poor stent expansion. So to conclude, we learn based on the IBAS and OCT, the calcium score is quite helpful. But what is the key is really understanding is how much total amount of the volume of the calcium in the region. That's really indicating the stent expansion. But I do recommend to start with a careful angiographic evaluation because that help us and also complement in terms of the, especially in the IBAS imaging, because we couldn't see the sickness of the calcium. And finally, I think that we are learning more and more about the calcified nodule, and we really have to understand the best treatment of the calcified nodule. Thank you. So thanks, uh, Akiko. Many compliments for your uh, important overview and explanation on uh, how to guide our procedure and which tool according to the uh, imaging, uh, IOS or CT, this depends also on CalLab facilities, to use in order really to guide us and to avoid what will be actually the... Uh, the object of the next lecture. Again, all the questions will be discussed uh, at the end of this first section. So thanks, Akiko. And I think, again, this was a very good introduction to the next talk, uh, that what we want to avoid with the imaging, uh, the, the how to treat uh, calcified instant restenosis. Because clearly, I mean, if you have a calcified instant restenosis, what, what you have to do. And the lecturer is going to be Bruno Scheller from University of Saarland, Germany. So please, uh, Dr. Scheller. Dear German, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Bruno Scheller from Saarland University in Germany. And uh, my talk is about calcified instant restenosis, how to treat. Um, we are all aware that um, treatment of calcified coronary lesions is associated with high rent rates, uh, more than doubling uh, uh, mortality uh, compared to uh, non-calcified lesions. Um, and if we look in the guidelines, uh, what's recommended for this situation, um, we have only limited uh, recommendations, for example, in the European guidelines uh, on revascularization. Um, Lesion preparation with different tools uh, is recommended, uh, particularly those with heavy calcification. However, they clearly state 
that this should be done prior to stand implantation. Um, the general recommendations for the treatment of instant restignosis are related to the uh, way of local truck delivery. Uh, we have here for truck routing stands and truck routed balloons uh, the same level of recommendation with 1A uh, level. Uh, furthermore, um, hard team uh, should uh, be included in uh, uh, severe cases and additional imaging uh, has also a recommendation grade 2A. Um, what is the uh, randomized data we have for the treatment for uh, calcified coronary lesions? Uh, we have the Otaxus trial comparing uh, conventional balloon angioplasty with uh, root ablation before uh, truck routing stand implantation. And as you can see, um, root ablation uh, is uh, superior in terms of acute gain compared to um, uh, conventional balloon angioplasty. However, the additional injury created uh, in combination with first generation drug loop extent, um, a higher late lumen loss. So that at the end of the day, the benefit was limited of the water ablation. Um, the prepare calc uh, trial um, compared the use of uh, specialty balloons like cutting or scoring balloons uh, with uh, rotor ablation um, for lesion preparation prior to current generation packaging stand implantation. Uh, and as you can see, the specialty balloons uh, have almost the same acute gain as the uh, road ablation. Um, however, there's a relevant number of cases that required crossover to road ablation. This means that if you can prepare a lesion with um, specialty balloons, there is no need for additional road ablation. However, in some cases, uh, you have to, to cross over. Uh, what about stents in calcified lesions? Uh, this chart shows you very elegantly that even with high pressure non compliant balloons, um, depending on the uh, degree of calcification, we have incomplete um, stand expansion, resulting in increased risk for uh, stand thrombosis and uh, restenosis. Um, another um, uh, issue is long term follow up after drug loading stand implantation. We see neoatherosclerosis. And in many cases, this neoatherosclerosis um, is calcified and uh, contributes to um, severe uh, resistant instant restenosis. Um, another issue long term we have with calcium is that stent fractures are more frequent than in non calcified um, coronary arteries. Um, how should we treat? Um, this is a proposal uh, we made for. Uh, the general treatment of instant restenosis. Um, number one, you have to be aware of the mechanism of um, this instant restenosis. So additional imaging uh, uh, is maybe helpful. Um, if you have an undersized, underexpanded um, stent, uh, which is frequently the case in calcified uh, instant restenosis, uh, the recommendation is to use high pressure non compliant um, balloons. Um, if intimal hyperplasia is the uh, main contributor to instant restenosis, um, uh, specialty balloons and other um, devices may be a good option for lesion uh, preparation. Um, what kind of specialty balloons uh, are available? We have um, different scoring balloons. Uh, we have a cutting balloon. Then we have uh, road ablation. We have orbital atherectomy intravascular lithoplasty, and uh, in some, for some cases, uh, laser treatment. Um, the recommendation and guidelines is to prepare the lesion before you implant the stent. However, if you have a, a severe calcified instant restenosis, in some cases, uh, rotational atherectomy uh, may be an option to um, uh, get rid of the calcium, which is intraluminal. Um, and another option uh, could be optical arthrectomy. However, we have to be aware that if we do this procedure, uh, we also um, modify the stand itself. So this means we have to look very careful at the end of the procedure what, what is uh, the status of the prior implanted stand. A relatively new method uh, is um, intravascular lithoplasty. Um, here we have data that with um, uh, instant restenosis, um, there is a chance to correct the calcium outside the stent, uh, 
and uh, improve the lumen. However, we have to be aware that this is, is a relatively new treatment modality. And if you have several layers of metal, the, the method doesn't work anymore. Coming back to a case uh, we treated a few months ago. This was a 79 year old male with three vessel disease and he had a prior long standing uh, in, his, in his LED. Uh, he presented clinically with unstable angina. And we did what we always do. We start with uh, semi-compliant balloons. Uh, why? Because uh, semi-compliant balloons, <clears throat> it's very easy to, to realize if there are um, areas that are resistant to ba balloon uh, dilatation. And here you can see that the balloon is not fully expanded. And this means here we had this area with high calcification. So what did we do? We used non-compliant balloon, high pressure. And here you can see what happened. This was at 25 atmosphere. We had a balloon, balloon rupture uh, with parabasation of uh, the contrast media. Uh, so a very unpleasant situation. Uh, so what options do we have? Conservative treatment, stop the procedure. Ask your cardiac surgeon if he can uh, take over the case. Covered stand craft um, to cover this uh, parabasation. However, we have to be aware of the implant of the covered stand craft. He will not be fully expanded and you will have a high risk of uh, thrombosis and, and restenosis. Um, another option would be take another non-compliant balloon and do it again. Um, cutting scoring balloons, especially balloons are an option. Atherectomy devices could be discussed um, or simply put another stand in it, uh, hoping that you will cover uh, the, the um, intersection with this. Um, so what, what can we do? Uh, we decided in this case uh, for intravascular lithoplasty, uh, three, three applications with uh, a 2.5, 12 millimeter uh, shockwave uh, balloon. And um, this was the initial result. So we had um, modification of the, of the calcium outside the stand. However, this primary result was not uh, really good, but we had control over the uh, dissection and polarization. So what's next? Um, one option in this situation is to use specialty balloons. We have, for example, the data from the ESA Desire 4 trial showing that if you prepare an instant resinosis with a scoring balloon compared to conventional balloon angioplasty, you end up uh, with better initial loom gain and potentially lower resinosis rate over time. Um, this has been done in this case. Um, several inflations with uh, scoring balloon 3.0 um, and in addition, additional uh, inflations with a 3.0 non-compliant balloon. And um, what is the, the goal of, of this lesion preparation? Um, our um, recommendation is to achieve an acceptable result and acceptable means by definition that we have no flow limiting dissection. Um, a residual stenosis of uh, less than um, 30%. And if we fulfill these criteria, then uh, there is no need for additional uh, stand implantation for another layer of metal, then the recommendation is to use a tricoated balloon. Um, this is um, elegant work from Japan, looking in more detail on the quality criteria of uh, lesion preparation before tricoated balloon. And here you can clearly see that um, the cutoff uh, for good outcome was a residual stenosis of less than 20% after the lesion preparation, uh, DCB to stent ratio of close to one, and a longer balloon inflation time. And if you fulfill all this uh, uh, quality criteria of lesion preparation, you can end up with a very low target lesion failure rate. Uh, however, if you do not fulfill this criteria, then the recurrence rate is extremely high. So um, the decision on how to proceed with a stand, not a stand or a DCB uh, should clearly be depending on fulfilling, fulfilling the criteria of lesion preparation. So this was the result here in this patient. After lesion preparation, you can see that we have uh, uh, residual stenosis, which was clearly less than 30%. We have no flow limiting dissections here visible. So we decided for a DCB treatment, this was a sequence P3.030 in the proximal part and 2.520 um, in the distal part of the instant stenosis. And this was the primary side. 
Um, here you can see the OCT at the end of the procedure, and you can see that the stand is uh, fully expanded in all areas with a homogeneous new intima still there, of course. Um, when we come then to the, to the part where we had this initial balloon rupture, there are dissections, as you can see, but it's not uh, flow limiting. And we uh, know that uh, pachytoxic coated balloons create uh, some kind of uh, regression of, of neo intima over time. So we are fine with this remaining neo intima uh, amount here in this area. Um, we had uh, recharged this, uh, rescheduled this patient uh, six weeks later because we wanted to treat his right coronary artery uh, in a second session. Here you can see uh, that the uh, uh, instant resynthesis is still patent and looks well. Another interesting observation is here that we had, where in the area we are, we had this balloon, balloon rupture. There is still some a small polarization. However, this patient will remain on DAPT for 12 months. So I don't think this is really an issue. So my conclusion about calcified instant resynthesis is that number one, we have very limited data, especially from randomized clinical trials. Uh, in most cases, uh, treatment will be a um, stepwise approach, first to uh, uh, deal with stand under expansion, and maybe in the uh, further course of the intervention, get rid um, of the calcium or correct the calcium at least. Um, so this means we uh, need different tools uh, frequently for lesion preparation, including uh, non-compliant balloons with high pressure inflations, cutting scoring balloons, in some cases, arterectomy devices. Laser uh, has been named, I have no personal experience with this, and very new and, and very effective uh, lithoplasty. And at the end of the procedure, you have to decide what kind of local truck delivery you will do to avoid repeated restenosis. And this means the decision between another layer of metal um, or a truck coated balloon. Thank you very much. So thanks for this presentation. We are at the end of this first section, and so we can open to discussion these uh, uh, three talks. I don't know if there are already some questions from the panelists that they would like to pose on topic that they would like to, to discuss. Hi, James. Sorry, those were great lectures. My question for the panel uh, is the impact of intravascular lithotripsy, is that a tool that people are reaching to first, or is it a tool for failed dilation or failed atherectomy? Okay, it's a very interesting question. I think we don't have uh, still data that actually orient on that. The data are coming mostly from uh, company-driven uh, studies. Uh, I think there is a lot we have to learn more. It's, for example, a tool that I have in the car lab and I use. I have my personal uh, idea on that where it works better, but again, uh, it's just for personal idea. We need data more to do that. On, on that, I think it's a good point also of, uh, I mean, I don't know which is the opinion of the others. Do we have a clear idea for indication for lithotripsy or when, when do you use it? So let's start with my co-moderator. When do you use the lithotripsy if lithotripsy is available in Korea? Because honestly, I yeah, don't know. So it's a, you know, unfortunately, and the lithotripsy and the radio mm. is not yet available. And we okay. have just the uh, low tabulation is available. So many the uh, interventional cardiologists in our nation, also in the Asian Pacific area is wondering how can you adapt the lithotripsy or laser? So how about the, Dr. So Nakamura and the lithotripsy is available in Japan or uh, in the... Oh, thank you. Thank you for the question. So not yet. So we are waiting, but uh, some kind of the uh, thickness of the device. Maybe uh, we need to prepare some hole to deliver the lithotripsy to the lesion, especially in the hard calcium. Yeah. Okay. In US, for example, how when do you indicate it in your center? When it's a good indication for you for lithotripsy? Uh, this is for go ahead, Doctor Lee. Yeah. Thank you for the question. Um, a couple thoughts. Um, when somebody has a poor LV systolic function, uh, I think atherectomy may be 
a little bit too much for the patient to compromise, especially if you don't have any mechanical circulatory support. So I think uh, in that situation, lithotripsy is a good option. Um, however, if it's a long diffuse lesion, remember the balloon's 12 millimeters in length. So you don't want to do three <laughs> inflations uh, throughout the whole lesion. It just takes too long. Um, but the one real benefit of atherectomy is that those lesions that are not only calcified, but are very severely diseased that may preclude the advancement of even a lithotripsy balloon. Um, I don't recall any time where if you have a wire across a lesion that uh, an atherectomy device like rotoblader or orbital atherectomy will not cross. So there are some, some uh, caveats that I would use. Uh, with respect to instant restenosis, I think uh, my device of choice would be lithotripsy uh, because the thought of using an atherectomy and perhaps uh, causing some uh, mechanical disruption of the stent does not sound appealing. In, in theory, you probably had some showering of uh, some metallic device of the stent material going downstream. So rather than perturb the stent, my preference is used to use lithotripsy to address the calcium that's superficial and behind the stent without causing any trauma to the stent. Yeah, I do agree. I mean, we do, we have a little tripsy. We started our experience, I think, uh, a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. We had a lot of enthusiasm from the beginning. I have to say that there are some subsets where, honestly, we didn't see so much advantage. Mm -hmm. I think what we are using now, clearly, there is the issue of deliverability, as you said. So if it's an uncrossable lesion, a way that mm -hmm. lithotripsy device can cross, mm -hmm. so you have mm -hmm. to consider that. It can be also a combinated strategy, by the way, with rotablator. Usually we use it when there are some nodules of calcium because you can crack the calcium and then you decide if you further going with the imaging guidance with the rotablator or ballooning with non-compliant then mm -hmm. stenting. Uh, however, in the stent, uh, restenosis, honestly, the results that we had were not so good. Mm -hmm. Your point is, uh, and it's uh, in a topic that we did not touch, what if indeed uh, you do not evaluate properly the calcium, you impl implant the stent, and then you understand that the stent is not uh, well deployed. You have the net. Absolutely, absolutely. Because so that I can be... Mm -hmm. And a niche mm -hmm. for, um, for example, for shockwave mm -hmm. in acute. Right. Because in later stage, honestly, our experience was not so positive. Data, I don't know. They're not so clear. I mean, it's a question mark, by the way. Great, great. So, Akiko, is, I have one question. And the, you, you are actually it's a very uh, educational, very important. We know where intravascular imaging uh, is essential part for calcified region PCI. So we have now very uh, several type of uh, uh, calcified region toolkit, the uh, razor, rota, orbiter, and shock wave, or something like that. So on the basis of uh, some particular imaging finding, can you guide which type uh, of uh, atherectomy device would be best for some calcified region? I think we don't have the super clear answer based on the outcome, but yeah, clinical, it's based on yeah, yeah based on imi imaging imaging morphology, you can sure. decide uh, which type of the other community device. Sure, I think that as we discussed by now, it's first when we use the lithotripsy, you have you should be able to deliver, right? But once you deliver, including the intravascular imaging, if the wire bias is a good location, that's a good way to go atherectomy, right? Mm -hmm. So if the wire bar is completely separate and putting on the normal segment, it's actually dangerous. So I, intravascular imaging can tell us. And if, if that is very circumferential and very long, uh, we have to work more. And then actually, intravascular imaging guidance, lithotripsy can be done, meaning where we should focus because we cannot put everywhere, like the Michael said, right? Mm -hmm. So I think the indication is a wire bias and also the distribution of the calcium, not only the which device, but also where should I treat in the long mm -hmm. region? That's how intravascular imaging tell us. Okay, great. Uh, uh, I have a question to Akiko. And uh, we know uh, uh, OCT uh, has higher resolution. Uh, uh, in, in China, uh, some doctors, especially 
uh, coming uh, from, uh, they, they learned a lot from CRF. They recommend us to guide a calcified lesion using OCT. And, and but, uh, uh, in our daily practice, sometimes, uh, I don't think I don't think it's reason. Uh, it, it, I don't think it's reasonable for all the cases. And uh, do we have any comment on on that? I think after a long time, by looking both cybers and OCT, I think they are almost similar. Uh, mm -hmm. Meaning, like as long as you understand correctly, I think both can similar help you how to do it. Like the. Ibis cannot see the thickness, but as long as the calcium is very circumferential long, typically they are thick calcium as well. And so I think that whatever you do either, I think it help you correctly, that's important. And also when we need the uh, intravascular imaging to see is when the patient having the very severe calcium is CTO or renal insufficiency, those are the very severe calcium patients which we cannot use the OCT. So I think that ultimately, it depends what you prefer and what you are used to do. That's number one. And also sometimes it's just, we can use only the IBIS. So ultimately we should understand each other both and then making the best choice. And I think the good thing of the OCT, of course we can see the thickness of the calcium, but can be predictable by IBIS as well, as long as you see the angio very carefully. Uh, uh, I, 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 I don't, uh... Uh, use uh, always use OCT for calcified lesion um, because uh, uh, after we do rotor or or, or dilate uh, the lesion, sometimes dissection happen. Yeah. Uh, before yeah. we implant stent, uh, I must uh, check uh, uh, intravascular imaging and see whether the calcified lesion uh, ha have have been ruptured. Uh, so um, uh, I will see my first choice. But uh, for instant uh, calcified lesion, uh, OCT is my first. Yeah, I agree. Okay, I think a time slightly delayed. We're gonna move to the second part. So, uh, second part is the shock. Is that uh, in the our cataract we have a lot of situation is optimal treatment uh, cardiogenic shock or some multivessel and STEMI patient. And the second part is about the story about how to save the shock. And the first lecture, I'm going to introduce the Daniel Bohok, and he's a famous uh, uh, the shock uh, study uh, expert, and he's uh, uh, in the Cardiovascular Research Foundation in New York. He will be talking about the mechanical circulatory support for cardiogenic shock insight from hemodynamic uh, simulation. Dr. Bohok. Hi, my name is Dan Burkhoff, and I am from the Cardiovascular Research Foundation in New York City, and I'm going to talk to you about mechanical circulatory support for cardiogenic shock, insights from hemodynamic simulations. These are some of my relevant disclosures. I'm going to be talking to you about the hemodynamics of cardiogenic shock and mechanical support through the window of the pressure volume relationship just to remind you, this is a normal pressure volume relationship that describes the four events of the cardiac cycle, uh, the isovolumic contraction, ejection, isovolumic relaxation, and filling. The normal pressure volume loop sits within the boundaries of the end diastolic pressure volume relationship, EDPVR, at the bottom, and the end systolic pressure volume relationship, ESPVR, at the top. Pressure volume loop uh, falls within these boundaries of the EDPVR and the ESPVR. And um, this graph shows what happens when you change preload. As you increase preload, the volume uh, and diastolic volume increases, the uh, stroke volume, the pressure generation, the stroke work all increase, but the uh, end systolic and end diastolic points always hit the EDPVR and the ESPVR. Similarly, when you change afterload, you can see that as afterload is increased, the stroke volume decreases, uh, but the pressure, vol uh, the pressure generation goes up. Uh, but again, the loops fall within the boundaries of the ESPVR and the EDPVR. Finally, when the contractility changes, the slope of the end systolic pressure volume relationship changes. So with an increase in contractility, the ESPVR slope increases. With a decrease in contractility, the ESPVR slope 
decreases. This slide now is going to show what happens in the setting of acute biventricular failure when you have a, a reduction in both the, the contractility of the RV and the LV. What's happening is that um, both contractilities are decreasing, the blood pressure and the cardiac output are decreasing, and in response to that, the baroreceptors are activated, the heart rate increases, you can see that the ball is going around the loops faster, but uh, the SVR increases, and also the baroreflexes increase the, um, the stress blood volume, which results in increases in generally increases in central venous pressure and pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. However, depending on the, the relative degrees of LV and RV compromise, um, CVP and wedge can, um, can go up or down um, and can be a very complex relationship. This actually shows data from the cardiogenic, work shock, cardiogenic shock working group showing in individual patients the relationship between right atrial pressure and pulmonary capillary wedge pressure at the time of presentation. And we've divided this, um, uh, this graph into four quadrants, kind of euvolemic in the bottom left, left-sided congestion where the wedge is elevated but the RAP is, is normal, uh, bilateral congestion where both RAP and wedge are both elevated, and isolated right-sided congestion where the CVP is elevated and the wedge is normal. And what you can see is that fully 50% of patients present with bilateral congestion, meaning both the RAP and the wedge are increased. Next, 25% of patients present with, um, with isolated left ventricular congestion, meaning just the wedge pressure is elevated. And then there's a mix between patients with euvolemia and also a smaller percentage that, of patients that present with just right-sided congestion. Uh, the congestion profile has a, a significant impact on mortality, as you can see here. Patients who are euvolemic or only have isolated left ventricular or left-sided congestion have a, about a 50% mortality compared to patients who have uh, right-sided or bilateral congestion, um, indicating that CVP is a very significant uh, driver of mortality. And that was true uh, in general whether or not the shock was due to uh, acute myocardial infarction or due to um, a, acute a decompensated heart failure shock. Now, if we start talking about the devices that can be treated and how their effects can be viewed on the pressure volume diagram, first we can start with balloon pump. And here you see at the bottom the effect on, on aortic pressure. You see the pressure augmentation during diastole. And on the left ventricular pressure volume diagram, you can see that there's a small decrease in systolic pressure, the peak of the loop, and that is the offloading, the afterload reducing effects of balloon pump. And that results in a small decrease in pulmonary capillary wedge pressure and a small increase in the cardiac output. All told, on average, balloon pumping is thought to uh, provide about a four millimeter reduction in wedge pressure and on average about a 0.4 to 0.5 liter per minute increase in, uh, in forward cardiac output. So um, uh, as a mechanical circulatory support device, the balloon pump is not that effective. If instead we start turning towards uh, active uh, mechanical circulatory support devices, we see here we'll discuss first the uh, transvalvular pumps, that is, mainly the impella family of devices. And here you see the impact of, of, of uh, pumping blood from the LV to the aorta actively with such a device. And on the pressure volume diagram, you can see several important points. Number one is the loop shifts leftwards and downwards on the end diastolic pressure volume relationship, indicating the unloading that is provided by the device. Second, the loop changes from a rectangle to a triangle, in, um, which is because the device is continuously pulling blood out of the ventricle, and we have loss of the isovolumic phases uh, uh, that are characteristic of the sides of the uh, normal pressure volume loop. So that's what causes it to be a triangle. Third, at the bottom here in the pressure uh, time domain, you can see that there is un that there can be uncoupling between LV systolic pressure and aortic pressure. That means aortic pressure can be higher than LV systolic pressure. And in this case, 
the aortic valve it remains closed. Um, in the case of an LVAD, a closed aortic valve like this is really not a problem because there is maintained flow within the LV chamber and in the proximal root of the aorta due to the pumping action of the, um, of the impella. These are actual real loops that are measured from a patient. Here you see support without, uh, here you see the loops without support. You have this uh, kind of rectangular or tra trapezoidal shape. And then during support with an impella 5.0, you see that the loops have become tri tri uh, triangular. And uh, also the unloading effect, you see that the loops shift downwards and leftwards, marking out the end diastolic and the end systolic pressure volume relationships, as I showed you at the beginning of this lecture. Now, if we turn to VA ECMO, we see a very different kind of uh, pattern. And here, what, what we see is that as the device is activated, the afterload pressure is increased, which is good for the perfusion to the uh, peripheral organs. However, this afterloading effect has a very different effect than a, val than a transvalvular pump like an, like an impella, because unlike impella, with ECMO, it's the heart itself that has to eject the blood out into the aorta um, to, um, uh, to empty the ventricle. So when the aortic pressure goes up, the only way for a weakened ventricle to overcome this new increase in pressure is to retain, retain fluid until by startling mechanism, it can now generate uh, enough pressure to open the valve and eject the uh, residual amount of venous return that is, uh, that is coming to it. Um, now, in extreme cases, the heart can become uh, completely overloaded, and um, that results in both uh, elevations of the end diastolic pressure, which means that there's elevations of the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure as well, and, and in some cases also the aortic valve can become shut. And here's an example of a patient on ECMO, um, and you see here that the aortic valve is completely shut. There's smoke in the proximal aorta, there's smoke in the left atrium and the left ventricle, and this sets up a situation that is uh, prime for, uh, for development of thrombus in both the aortic root and in the ventricular chambers. Here's another example showing a patient who presented without pulmonary edema but in severe cardiogenic shock, was put on ECMO. You can see that the patient went into pulmonary edema after being put on ECMO. You can see here the smoke in the LA and the LV, the poor LV contraction due to the marked increase in afterload. And here you can see uh, that there's already the start of thrombus formation. Um, these are um, uh, results of an animal experiment uh, done in the laboratory of Professor uh, Jacob Moeller in, um, in, um, in Denmark, showing at the top here impella effects, and at the bottom is ECMO effects. Let me just walk you through this. Here is the normal pressure volume loops on the left. In the middle here is the cardiogenic shock state. You see the marked reductions in the end systolic pressure volume relationship. This animal was then put on impella, and you see the reduction in end diastolic pressure. You see the triangulation of the, of the uh, loop, and you see the reduction in the, uh, the work of the, of the heart um, due to the, um, the, the ventricular assist device taking over for the work of the heart. At the bottom is the ECMO arm of this animal experiment. Again, here you see normal loops. In the middle, you see the cardiogenic shock state. And here you see the animal being put on ECMO. And in this case, you see that the pressure generation is high. The loop is not ejecting. The, the, the beat is isovolumic because the, um, uh, the, device, the, the heart cannot overcome the uh, pressure that's being generated by the, um, uh, by the uh, ECMO. Now, there are many ways to unload the heart in ECMO. And one of the ways that has become uh, very uh, prominent for many, many reasons is combining ECMO plus a, an impella device, and that's what you see here. Once you put a patient who's on ECMO and, and has LV overload on, on impella support, you can see here that the impella can completely counteract that loading effect. In addition here, now you have two pumps that are working in parallel. So in this case, we haven't turned down the pump, the ECMO or the impella. We're working both at nearly full speed. So we have a lot of flow a lot of pressure to, to, um, to help support the patient 
and you can at this point already start to, to uh, uh, wean um, the, the ECMO machine uh, to, uh, uh, to the point where you have adequate flow to the body and pressure to the body that is provided by both, uh, both devices. Here's another real life example. This patient presented with uh, cardiogenic shock and a wedge pressure of almost 40. Patient was crashed onto ECMO. And you see here the wedge pressure increased. Patient was then put on Impella and the, um, and the pressures declined uh, very rapidly. So in summary, understanding cardiac physiology in the framework of the ventricular pressure volume domain helps to explain the hemodynamics of cardiogenic shock and the, um, the effects of, an, of a balloon pumping ECMO and percutaneous LVADs like the Impella device. VA ECMO has the potential to increase the load on the LV and reduce aortic valve opening, leading to LV and aortic root stasis. Um, Impella directly unloads the LV and provides increased systemic pressure and flow, and Impella can counteract the loading effects of ECMO. Thank you, and um, I hope that this uh, brief introduction to hemodynamics in the pressure volume domain and some simulations that were provided by our Harvey simulator have been helpful uh, to your understanding of cardiogenic shock and mechanical circulatory support. Thank you. Thank you. Great lecture, Daniel Bohok. So I'm, uh, after three lecture, we will have uh, uh, enough discussion time. I'm going to move to second lecture. This is uh, absolutely long-standing unmet issue in clinical practice. And uh, I'm going to introduce Dr. Uh, Dibika uh, Pereira and the St. Thomas campus, King's College, London, United Kingdom. And the can PCI save life in patients with severe LV dysfunction? Dr. Pereira? Thank you, Dr. Park. And thank you also to uh... Uh, all the, the TCT organizers for giving me this opportunity to, to talk. I hope that you can see my, my slides now. So the topic I was asked to talk on was, can PCI save lives in patients with severe LV dysfunction? And I think uh, it would be useful for us to think of LV dysfunction in two different contexts or two different types of acuity. The first part of my talk will be on whether PCI has a role in improving survival in patients with acute uh, LV dysfunction, cardiogenic shock, which is what um, uh, the last talk was, was uh, about as well. Now, I don't need to, to remind everyone of the, the shock trial results because that trials sort of several decades in our, uh, it's been in our, in our uh, minds for several decades. So that, formulates some of the green parts of this uh, management algorithm from, from ESC, which is that we really need to do angiography early. And if you find um, culprit disease, that should be revascularized either by PCI or CABG, although we know that the vast majority of this is CABG. Now, have a look at that red line, which is no routine PCI of non-IRA -IR lesions. In other words, multi-vessel PCI is not recommended. And it's worth reminding ourselves where that data came from. Uh, and this was the culprit shock trial, which came out uh, a few years ago. And remember, culprit shock randomized just over 700 patients who had multivessel disease to either have infarct-related artery revascularization only, uh, shown on the left-hand side of the screen, or to multivessel PCI, immediate multivessel PCI. And just zooming in on a couple of uh, factors, we'll see that a significant proportion of the patients they enrolled had multivessel disease, three-vessel disease found in, in almost two-thirds of patients, and that 20 to 25 percent of uh, the patients also had a CTO. So this is not simple uh, non-IRA disease. This is fairly complex multivessel disease that they, they uh, enrolled. It's also worth knowing that in the final uh, playing out of the trial, there was a fair amount of crossover, that there were patients in the IRA only arm who ended up having PCI of non-culprit lesions, immediate PCI, uh, and conversely, that actually um, uh, even in the multivessel arm, there were patients who had IRA only PCI, and this may have some impact. Um, and also that non 
only doing your IRA PCI at the time at that index procedure didn't mean that you wouldn't then go on and do stage non-coverage PCI, which is, if you like, another version of crossover. And we should also be aware that although these are statistically <clears throat> significant differences, that there were differences between the arms in the use of um, uh, mechanical circulatory support devices. And this really relates to what Dan Burkhoff has been talking about. There was more ECMO use used in uh, the, the multivessel PCI uh, arm, and this was probably after PCI, and more impeller use in the uh, infarct-related artery-only arm. Nevertheless, those differences notwithstanding, these were the headline results that um, the, the, the primary uh, outcome event occurred much less often in those patients who had carpet lesion only PCI. Uh, and when you then broke that down into death or renal replacement therapy, or you did landmark analyses, the results were still, still the same, that doing um, multivessel PCI seemed to be detrimental and that detriment was particularly in the first 30 days. And so the current guidelines do not recommend multivessel PCI routinely in patients who present with cardiogenic shock during the index procedure. But that doesn't rule out staged uh, non-culprit PCI. And I know Dr. Mates is gonna to talk to us about non-culprit PCI in non-shock STEMI, and some of those lessons may apply even in the, the convalescent phase of um, cardiogenic shock. And you know, this is my, my uh, practice, and I think it's down to the risk benefit of treating each lesion. Whereas you may not undertake a CTO of a non culprit vessel, you may, if the, the circumstances demand it, undertake a, a procedure which you perceive to have a, a lower risk and a greater benefit. Those are my own. That's my own interpretation of the, of, of the guidelines. So we'll now move down the algorithm, the cardiogenic shock algorithm, and you see a lot of yellow. Yellow means class two, um, but depending on whether it's class two A or two B, it's that it may be indicated in some patients. And a lot of those yellow indications relate to mechanical circulatory assist devices. We've seen lots of simulations and lots of compelling physiological data in the previous talk, but how does that stack up in the, the clinical setting, what do the trials tell us? And I'm only going to talk about IABP, Impeller, and VA ECMO. We know about IABP shock 2, that whole Batila's trial that, that came out uh, nearly a decade ago, which showed that routine use of balloon pumps didn't seem to help. Now, there hasn't been a, a completed RCT of Impeller in cardiogenic shock, but there are these observational series from which we are... are inclined to, to draw inferences. The first thing to say is, health warning, this is not an RCT. These are observational data which are prone to biases. And while it seems to be that the higher volume centers, the centers that use Impella more routinely have a lower mortality, we've got to think about which patients get the devices in these two centers. If you're in a center that doesn't use Impella routinely, you will only reserve it for your sickest cohort of patients. And it may be that selection bias that dictates the, the outcome, whereas more uh, of your, your eligible patients will get it. So we still need an RCT. Again, observational propensity matched uh, comparisons of IABP versus Impeller. And in this particular report, there doesn't appear to be uh, a difference. But once again, these are not RCTs. And these are the limitations of carrying out um, non-randomized comparisons. So we need RCTs. But here's the problem with RCTs in cardiogenic shock. They're really difficult to carry out. And this slide is a, is, is a couple of years old now, uh, and it shows the completed trials. And we've already spoken about IAVP shock 2 and culprit shock. They were some of the largest trials completed to date in shock. That's great. But look at these trials on the right, which are shown in red. Uh, these are the ongoing trials or trials that are struggling to, to complete recruitment. Danger shock is, is very uh, eagerly awaited, but I heard just two weeks ago that we had to stop recruiting to Euroshock, for instance, because we just can't get the patients. Uh, 
ECLS shock likewise is ongoing, but these are difficult patients to recruit. So we need RCT data and we have to be careful about interpreting observational data, but these are very difficult RCTs to do. And if we have time to discuss it, I'm sure the panel will have some opinions on this. Now to the second question, and this is actually also really important. Can PCI improve survival in patients who have chronic OV dysfunction? Your stable coronary artery disease cohort who don't have an acute myocardial infarction and aren't in shock at the outset. Actually, the mode of revascularization that has been historically used most in these patients is coronary artery bypass surgery. And the STITCH trial tried to assess this in an RCT fashion. Again, the first output was nearly 10 years ago uh, from this group. Uh, and what it showed was that in the control arm, those patients who are medically treated, who had severe ischemic cardiomyopathy, five-year survival was nearly 50%. That is not a great uh, outcome, and that's why this question is still pertinent. Unfortunately, when you do bypass surgery mm -hmm. at five years, there isn't a, a benefit. And this is because early on, there's an excess mortality associated with bypass surgery, uh, and it takes much longer for that excess to, to uh, be balanced by the potential um, beneficial effects of revascularization itself. And in fact, if you do follow patients up for a longer period, those benefits of revasc really declare themselves. And you, it takes you nine or 10 years for the benefits to outweigh the hits that uh, you have to undergo when you do surgery on these patients with very poor early function. So the obvious question, why don't we do PCI on these patients? Because we found in a whole variety of trials and registries that PCI uh, can give you similar outcomes to bypass surgery. But take Excel for, for instance. There were hardly any patients in Excel who had impaired left ventricular function. So really, the question about PCI for improvement of left ventricular function is largely unknown. It's also worth us remembering that it's not without risk. Now, these are some data from the British Cardiovascular Intervention Society, which we published a few years ago. And of course, mortality is much higher in poor OB patients when you look at the acute cohort. But even when you look at patients who are stable to start with, outcomes are far worse in the impaired left ventricular function um, than if you have moderately impaired or normal left ventricular function. And as things stand, these are old guidelines because there are no new data with which to update the guidelines. PCI has a class 2B indication with a level of evidence C, meaning we don't have RCTs to inform this. I'm going to finish my talk with just a couple of minutes telling you about a trial which we have just completed in the UK, of which, which uh, I had the privilege of being chief investigator. So this was a trial done uh, across approximately 35 centers in the, in the UK. Uh, and that the more detail of the trial design can be found in this Jack Hart failure paper. Essentially, we, the hypothesis was that PCI will improve event-free survival in patients with severe ischemic cardiomyopathy and demonstrable viability on whatever modality you, you chose. And by event-free survival, mean, we mean all-cause mortality or hospitalization due to heart failure. 700 patients were, were enrolled. And we fortunately managed to just complete the trial before lockdown, the first lockdown in COVID. I, was that, I breathed a great sigh of relief because one week later, the UK was in, in lockdown. Um, the trial design was fairly, fairly simple. You had to have severe OB impairment. You had to have extensive coronary artery disease. At least two thirds of the myocardium subtended by severely diseased arteries. And there had to be evidence of viability in, in dysfunctional myocardium using either MRI, stress echo, or uh, PET-type nuclear imaging. And then they were randomized one-to-one -to, -one to have uh, PCI or OMT. We excluded patients who'd had a, who were within four weeks of a myocardial infarction. Um, and I can tell you that the two-year minimum follow-up will be completed in March, and we hope to have uh, results for all of you 
presented at ESC 2022. So not long to wait for, for the answer to this question. So this is my summary of revascularization in stable LV dysfunction. Surgical revascularization does appear to be of benefit, but it comes at very high procedural cost. And it may, in a population, take years for the initial hit to, to be balanced by those gains. We need to wait for a revive before we offer PCI routinely for patients. And when we do think about PCI, what do we target? Segmental viability, segmental ischemia, is it complete revascularization based on these considerations? There are, there are a lot of unanswered questions, but I hope not long to wait. I'll stop there. Thank you. Great, great lecture. We are very happy to invite the uh, PI of the revived trial. We are, uh, every, I think everyone is hope to hear is a uh, primal result in the upcoming ESC meeting. So lastly, I introduced the uh, world-renowned uh, famous uh, uh, trialist and uh, Simon Meta and the Hamilton General Hospital Canada, and he's a PI of a complete trial. We're gonna ask a lecture revascularization strategy for STEMI with the multivascular disease. Yes. So, okay, Dr. Meta. Um, so today I'll be speaking about revascularization strategies for STEMI and multivessel disease. And these are my disclosures. So over the last 10 years or so, uh, we have had at least six uh, randomized trials evaluating complete revascularization of non-culprit lesions in patients with STEMI. It started initially with the PRAMI trial, which was a modest uh, size trial, uh, and then most recently, uh, the large complete trial. Uh, these trials all shared in common the fact that there was a reduction in urgent revascularization. But the key question that we were interested in is, is there a reduction in hard irreversible clinical endpoints, given the fact that by nature, these are open label trials. Uh, and so that is really what compelled us to uh, design the complete trial, uh, which was a trial of 4,000 patients, of patients who present with STEMI and multivessel coronary artery disease. They required a uh, successful primary PCI to the culprit lesion uh, and an additional stenosis of at least 70% by visual estimation. Patients who had lesions of 50 to 69% required an FFR for trial inclusion, and they were randomized to receive either complete revascularization with routine staged PCI of all suitable non-culprit lesions regardless of whether they were symptomatic and regardless of whether there was any ischemia on non-invasive testing, or they were uh, allocated to receive a culprit lesion only revascularization strategy uh, where there was no further revascularization of non-culprit lesions. All patients received guideline directed medical therapy. The majority were on ticagrelor or prasugrel as background therapy. And uh, it was a long-term follow-up trial of three years uh, with co-primary outcomes of CV death or UMI, and then the triple composite, which uh, included ischemia-driven revascularization. I think the results are well known uh, to most interventional cardiologists by now. Uh, there was a reduction in the first co-primary CV death or UMI. This reduction was about a 26% relative risk reduction. Um, it was highly significant, and the number needed to treat to prevent one CV death or UMI over a period of three years, median of three years, is only 37 patients, uh, which is uh, very reasonable. And then you'll see on the right-hand side, the triple composite of CV death, UMI, or IDR. The NNT here is even lower. Uh, perhaps not surprisingly, when we add IDR, we see a bigger 50% relative risk reduction, uh, and the NNT here is 13. Um, I think an important point that I will be speaking um, a little bit about today is the importance of actually achieving complete revascularization. Uh, in the complete trial, we were extraordinarily fortunate to have um, high volume centers. We selected high volume centers uh, in this trial specifically because we wanted that degree of experience. The experience not only with the interventional cardiologist, but the whole system, right from um, the EMS system to when the patient presents to the cath lab, to when the procedure is done, uh, the post-procedural nursing care, right up until follow-up. Um, so we specifically chose uh, large uh, STEMI centers, um, mainly in North America and uh, Europe. 
Uh, you'll see here a meta-analysis of the randomized controlled trials looking at cardiovascular mortality. Uh, and not, none of the trials, including complete, was powered in and of itself for reductions in cardiovascular mortality. Large numbers of patients would be needed to show a reduction in this endpoint. Uh, but when you look at a meta-analysis of the trials, and there have been at least two or three of these now presented, all with the same results, uh, showing that there is a uh, reduction in cardiovascular mortality, which is nominally significant depending on the type of model uh, that you use. Um, so all of these data have been considered uh, by the AHA ACC uh, guidelines, revascularization guidelines. This recommendation has now uh, replaced all prior recommendations for multi-vessel CAD in the prior PCI guidelines and the prior STEMI guidelines. Um, and they have now allocated uh, a 1A recommendation for uh, uh, complete revascularization or with PCI uh, of no, uh, non-infarct uh, lesions to reduce the risk of death or MI. You can probably count on one hand the number of 1A recommendations that exist in any guideline document for the performance of PCI under any circumstance. Um, so this is really quite an achievement, I think, over the last 10 years uh, with all of this data now accumulating and culminating uh, in this uh, recommendation. Now, there is still a lot more to be done. One of the issues that we need to address uh, is the timing of when we should be taking patients to the cath lab. We um, had uh, an inkling into what the optimal timing was and complete because the randomization was stratified according to the intended timing of revascularization. Um, and investigators have to specify before hitting the randomization button, do you intend to revascularize the patient during the index hospitalization or after the index hospitalization? And you'll see it didn't really make a difference in terms of the hazard ratios. Um, they were almost superimposable, uh, showing the benefit, both uh, if you did it early and late. And one of the reasons for that is this, is that early on, um, after a patient has a STEMI, um, most of the events are related not to the non-culprit lesion. They are related to the size and the severity of the index myocardial infarction, um, the degree of, of uh, hit the left ventricle took. Uh, and a lot of these events, particularly with regard to CV death, are due to uh, ar arrhythmic deaths or pump failure uh, deaths. Uh, nothing to do with the non-culprit lesion, really. We start to see the emergence of the importance of the non-culprit lesion over the longer term. Uh, so over the period of one, two, three, and four years, uh, we start to see the Kaplan-Meier curves uh, separating. And I think this has implications uh, for cardiogenic shock. And, you know, in cardiogenic shock, we have a very high early event rate. Uh, we see about a 50% mortality um, in the first 30 days. And it's very hard to show a benefit of this long-term reduction, mainly in non-fatal myocardial infarction when half of the patients have already died uh, at 30 days. Now, another critically important um, caveat to the complete trial is the complexity of the non-culprit lesion uh, disease. Remember that STEMI patients are generally younger than non-STEMI patients. The mean age, for example, in complete was only 61 years. A uh, substantial number of patients in their 40s, in their 50s, uh, and in their early 60s, and much fewer patients that are over the age of 80. This means that when patients with STEMI present, their baseline syntax scores are much lower. Uh, here, um, the baseline syntax score in the complete trial was only 16. Compare that with a, a syntax score in culprit shock of 24. The culprit lesion specific score was 8.8 .8 and 8.6. And the reason this is a little bit higher is because there are, there is, these are thrombotic lesions. And so they are assigned more points uh, according to the syntax score. The non-culprit lesion score, however, was fairly uh, low. It was a 4.5, meaning that these are tight lesions uh, that are relatively straightforward. Uh, and by performing PCI, we could really have a big impact. And most importantly, it can be done safely. You are not putting the patient at a significant risk. Um, these are really uh, very important details in the trial uh, that were you know, written into the protocol uh, in order for a patient to be eligible for the trial. 
And then the residual syntax score after the index PCI was only 7.2, um, which is less than in culprit shock where the residual syntax score is nine. And as I've pointed out earlier, we achieved 90, over 90% 90 complete revascularization in the trial defined as a syntax score of zero. If you look at the culprit shock trial, which did not show a benefit, the residual syntax score, uh, sorry, the degree of complete revascularization was less than 20%, less than 20%. So picture a drug trial, for example, where compliance with your study drug was less than 20%. It is virtually impossible to answer the question of complete revascularization when compliance with therapy is so strikingly low. One of the benefits uh, of this trial, one of the reasons that is so, it is so clear is that the intervention was performed in the vast majority of patients and it was done well. Now, if you cannot, the caveat to this is that if you cannot achieve uh, complete revascularization in your patient, if, you're, if the degree of disease is much more severe and you're going to be leaving behind significant non-culprit lesion disease, then I think it's incumbent on us to think about cabbage surgery as uh, a good alternative in these patients. There's still a lot we don't know about cabbage surgery. When do you do it? Do you do it early? Do you wait? Um, when do you stop the antiplatelet therapy because they just had a primary PCI? These are all unknown questions that we need to answer, but we need to remember that it's still a significant option for patients. Now, the other important question uh, that people ask all the time is what type of lesions um, benefited in this trial? And it was really the more severe non-culprit lesions that we saw a benefit in. We saw an interaction p-value here of 0.2. When we looked at the very tight lesions, according to the angiographic core lab, greater than 60% QCA non-culprit lesion stenosis. Uh, here, there was almost a 40% reduction in CV death or new MI. Uh, and you'll see the Kaplan-Meier curves here. Whereas if it was a more moderate lesion, a 50% lesion, there really wasn't a significant benefit. Uh, and we publish these data now in JAP. So again, the tighter non-culprit lesions are the ones that we really probably should be focusing on. The other issue is that, and I'm not sure in the Asia Pacific region, how many patients still get um, uh, lytic therapy, uh, but in certainly in Canada and in large parts of Europe, uh, patients still receive lytic therapy. There were a small number of patients that had a pharmacoinvasive strategy in the complete trial. And we showed in this trial that there was really uh, uh, a, um, a consistent effect in patients who receive a pharmacoinvasive strategy and those who receive true primary PCI. The other um, issue that I wanted to uh, just point out in the trial, and there'll be a full paper pending on this, is that the subgroup of patients with age less than 65 or over 65, there have been a lot of uh, registry studies, or not a lot, but there have been a few registry studies that have suggested older patients don't benefit. Well, we didn't see that incomplete. We saw a very consistent benefit of complete revascularization in older patients and younger patients with the interaction p-value not being significant. So somebody should not be excluded from complete revascularization if they are older. The next issue is, of course, is why. Why in this setting um, would we see a benefit of non-culprit lesion PCI? Why didn't they see it in the COURAGE trial or the ischemia trial, which are trials of stable CAD? We performed um, a multi-vessel OCT sub-study, um, which really produced some very interesting findings within the context of the complete trial. The first thing that we saw was that about half or about 47.3% of patients uh, had as their non-culprit lesion a thin cap fibroatheroma. In other words, a vulnerable plaque. The pathology looked like a vulnerable plaque similar to what the culprit lesion. It just so happened that the culprit lesion was the one that ruptured and caused the acute event, but about half of the non-culprit lesions also had this similar pathophysiology. So that um, in and of itself may account for one of the reasons. They're not all stable plaques in the non-culprit lesion. They're just as unstable as the culprit lesion was and they are prone to future plaque rupture. But I think the most important thing is, is that, plus the fact that when we look at these non-culprit thin cap fibroatheromas, 
uh, about a third of them or 35% of them are obstructive lesions. So the thin cap fibroatheromas, the vulnerable plaques are more likely to be the tighter lesions uh, within the non-culprit lesions, uh, non-culprit vessels. And that may be a mechanistic explanation for why we are seeing a reduction uh, in ischemic outcomes like myocardial infarction. Now, one of the issues that we are, are going to be looking at in the future, because you know, with that guideline recommendation and with the results of the complete trial, there has been a huge increase in the number of PCI procedures. And the question is, have, have we gone too far? And can we focus? Can we focus a little bit more on the lesions that really deserve to have a PCI uh, and we can leave the other lesions alone? And one of the ways of doing that is with a physiology guided strategy where we only intervene on physiologically significant lesions. We did a meta-analysis um, looking at the trials that looked at a physiology guided strategy and an angiography guided strategy. And you'll see the hazard ratios here are very similar, 0 0.69, 0 0.57. Um, maybe a little bit more for the angiography guided strategy, but the confidence intervals all overlap each other. And with the fact that we demonstrated incomplete that it was the more severe lesions uh, that benefited, those lesions are also likely to be the ones that are physiologically significant. So the question is, would an FFR guided strategy be better than an angiography guided strategy? This was tested recently in the FLOWER MI trial, a relatively smaller trial which did not show a significant benefit between the two uh, treatments but there are important caveats to this. The first is that it was far too small to show non-inferiority. There were, in this trial, there were only about 56 primary outcome events, which is nowhere near the number that would be needed. One needs to have several hundred outcome events in order to show non-inferiority. The second is that the trial only went out to one year. And as I showed you earlier, the time course of events in the, in, in, uh, after complete revascularization is a benefit that emerges after several years. So we really need a longer term follow up. So we need a larger study. Uh, we need a trial with longer term follow up. And we need a trial that is powered for safety outcomes. Because really, when we reduce the number of non culprit lesion PCIs, we hope that that translates into a safety benefit. Uh, in terms of major bleeding, in terms of stroke, in terms of stem thrombosis uh, in the future. And this trial um, was not even close to the size that would be necessary in order to address that. We will be starting very soon the COMPLETE2 trial. The COMPLETE2 trial will address this question, but on a far larger scale. Uh, there will be 5,100 patients. It will be a global trial. And patients with multivessel disease in both STEMI and non-STEMI will be randomized to receive a physiology-guided non-culprit lesion PCI strategy or an angiography-guided strategy. The median follow-up will be three and a half years. It'll be on a background of optimal medical therapy. And we will be looking at non-inferiority for efficacy and superiority for safety. And this is really where a, a physiology-guided strategy could potentially have a very big impact on our, our clinical practice. So I would urge you that if you are a center that uses physiology guided strategy, just continue to do so uh, and put your patients uh, in the complete two trial should it come to a region. We're really looking in this trial at North America, at Europe, and we are looking at Asia. Uh, so Korea, uh, Japan, um, and a number of other uh, countries in the Asia Pacific region that we hope uh, to have involved in the complete two trial. So thank you very much, uh, and I'll stop at that point. Okay, thank you, thank you, Samir. It's great lecture. So we, uh, we time is slightly over. We will have uh, some discussion time, and that this time we are invite uh, uh, complete trial PI also revival trial PI. So we will have uh, some discussion time. Is there any uh, comment or question to the presenter? If I may pose a question starting from the last, uh, from the complete two. So how do you envision this with the results of the flower trial? Because that's the big problem. Uh, I mean, uh, yeah. the flower so, trial actually demonstrated that, uh, I mean, uh, a physiology guided uh, is not superior to angiography in acute coronary syndrome settings. So uh, honestly, you know that there will be 
published in 2023 the new guidelines for uh, ACS from European Society of Cardiology. And I'm sure that this will be included in those guidelines. So I'll give you a vision to compare to. I would, um, I would strongly push back against mm. any guideline recommendation change based on flower MI trial. Strongly push back. The trial was far too small, far too. You cannot change a guideline recommendation based on a trial that had only 50 primary outcome events. That would be ludicrous to do that. Um, it, the trial was grossly underpowered and the trial was only a short-term trial that went out to one year. Um, so when we look at the huge amount of data that we have for physiology guided strategy, and then to take one study, one study that showed uh, that was underpowered and then to change a guideline recommendation and change global practice would be a big mistake. So caution. I don't know if, uh, I mean, I don't know if the guideline will be changed. I don't know, but this yeah, is I, the I, only... I would highly doubt it. It would certainly, I mean, the European guidelines may change, but it would not move the, uh, the, the North American no, guidelines. No, no, that's a question, Mark. We don't know because they will yeah. be published yeah, in 2023. I think there is a lot but, of uncertainty uh, as to the issue. There, there's a few misconceptions about a physiology guided strategy. First misconception is that a physiology guided strategy will reduce ischemic events. Well, of course it won't because you're leaving lesions behind. How could it possibly? So that's the first misconception, it won't. So what we, you need to do is show non-inferiority uh, with an angiography guided strategy where we open everything. Where a physiology guided strategy will shine is in terms of safety. It will be safer because you will not be going after as many lesions, you will have much less metal in the coronary arteries. And, and so, you know, can we achieve um, a, a just as good a result as we did in complete, uh, but safer for patients? That's the question. And that question has not been answered yet. No, I know, but I absolutely agree with you. And actually this is the practice that we were using, but I have to say that after the flower trial, that's the only randomized clinical trial that we have. And despite being under power, it's a negative trial. You have to take into consideration the result, by the way. And if you cannot clearly not indicate the physiology, I mean, uh, angiography, uh, it's the standard of care so far. Unfortunately, I have to say, because I'm a believer. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. let's no, see I, what I, happens. I think, I think it's a good point. I think it's a, it's, you, you raise a good point. Um, the complete trial results are very, very strong. Mm -hmm. um, but the caveats that I showed you within the trial was that the main benefit was in the tighter non-culprit lesions, not in the less severe lesions. And it's those tighter lesions that are physiologically significant. Um, the other thing is that um, angiography is a very blunt instrument. So the correlation between um, a, a visual uh, stenosis estimation and a QCA in the core lab is very, very poor. Um, does that matter in the end? We don't know. Um, we have a lot of core lab data. We have eight or 9,000 angiograms in the complete core lab. Uh, we'll be publishing more and more data as, as we, we get it um, on this issue, but there's a very poor correlation and a very high inter-observer um, uh, variability in the degree of, of stenosis. So the, the whole question is, can we sharpen our approach? Can we make it a little bit better? And of course, the other issue is, is OCT and imaging, and how does that play into all of this? So currently we're treating hemodynamics, currently we're treating the stenosis severity. Should we actually be treating the disease? Should we actually be treating the biology of the disease? And can we do that better uh, with intracoronary imaging? And within Complete 2, I didn't show it, but there will be the world's largest OCT study that will be embedded in that, where we will be doing uh, detailed OCT and AI uh, um, analysis of the non-culprit lesions and correlate that with long-term uh, outcomes. Um, so it'll really be quite a comprehensive uh, trial of both physiology as well as imaging. Okay, so on to the time limit, I'm going to raise the final question to Dr. Perera. So in the many interventional cardiologists waiting the pivotal result of the revived trial. So uh, it's uh, many, uh, you know, physician is wondering how can you do PCI? Is a complete versus incomplete or you just PCI for viable myocardium? Is a 
also I'm some concern about the duration of a follow-up, some limited is how do you think so? Yeah, so good questions. And I hope I can, we'll have answers to some of them uh, later this year. So, I mean, the first thing is, does it help uh, to improve survival? Uh, and if it does, what do we target? So the REVIVE protocol recommended that complete revascularization be pursued to all viable regions that could be revascularized. So it was all dri driven on viability. Uh, ischemia assessment as such wasn't mandated in the trial, so we couldn't build that in. But in, in sort of real life, maybe it'll be a combination of those two things that you you'd use. Um, but I, th I think we need to wait. The question of length of follow-up is, is also really important. How long should we follow these patients up for clinically? And what in an ideal trial, how long would you follow them up for? So when um, revived follow-up finishes, the minimum follow-up will be two years, mm -hmm. but the maximum follow-up will be around eight, eight and a half years. So we will have, it's actually a medium term follow-up trial that we'll be presenting for the first time. We had to hold back because it was very tempting to present one year results and so on, but we yeah. decided up front we'll wait for the two years. At least two years is what we need in these sorts of trials. I don't know whether the panel uh, agree, but We'll have some you know, the, the temptation in these trials is to try to present as early as possible. Believe me, I've been there uh, in that situation as an investigator, and it's really important to fight that, fight that urge to present the trial. Just wait, wait for the trial, wait for the intervention to have its effect. And there, I think a really good DSMB is important. Uh, and and yeah. I, I rely heavily on, on, on their advice. Great. So I think uh, you said we are at some 10 minutes over. I'd like to ask a final closing remark, uh, are they careful? Okay, so thank you. I think it was a very interesting session. Actually, we touch which are still uh, the, uh, the, um, the field that actually do not have an answer, I have to say. So the clinical need. The clinical need is still in very complex PCI and calcified lesion is... Uh, a field where actually we don't need, we don't have a clear answer. There are we have new tools and new technologies, but we are missing data. Thanks to these new algorithms that have been, have been developed, maybe we can have a way to choose between different strategies. But again, we need data and we need the trials to be sure on that. The second part is indeed on the support. That's another huge clinical need. Uh, I mean, I'm a big believer, and I think that very complex PCI can be done in centers that have available the tools, and in some selected cases also use appropriate uh, ventricular support. And at the end, the other big question regarding complete revascularization of which tools to be used, physiology versus angiography, and new trials hopefully will give us the answer. So thanks TCT Asia Pacific for this very interesting session. Thanks to all the speakers and thanks to my co-moderator. Thank you. Thank thanks, you. Everyone. Thank Great you, session. everyone.